Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Red Game Telecom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with NVIDIA, because the company are launching the GTX 1050 free gigabyte model, complete with a 96-bit memory bus. In other words, previous rumours have been confirmed. Then we're going to finish the video with the PlayStation 5. Specifically, one of the principal programmers over at Sony has been doing an awful lot of work on an LLVM-based compiler for the version 1 of the Ryzen architecture. So we're going to be investigating what that means. But first things first, the GTX 1050. NVIDIA have silenced the rumours by confirming that the GTX 1050 free gigabyte model is a real thing. More to the point, it's not just going to be an Asia-specific card. But the specs of this thing are actually rather interesting. And by interesting, I mean pretty damn baffling. So the number of CUDA cores for the card is 768, which is an identical number to that of the GTX 1050 Ti slash But perhaps even more surprising is it has a higher boost clock, 126 megahertz. Now, of course, boost clocks are somewhat guesstimates after all it could boost much higher than that especially if there's the overhead available but even so but it is a 96-bit memory bus now this of course makes an awful lot of sense after all it is three gigabytes of memory and because the uh, gddr5 memory runs at 32 bits so 32 64 96 you get the idea but Many folks, including myself, had maybe speculated that we'll see a slightly faster memory clock to make up for this. For example, 7.5 GHz or perhaps 8 GHz, something like that. So yes, it would have less memory bandwidth than the vanilla GTX 1050 2GB model. But instead, no, it's still running at a fairly lackluster, at least for the memory bus, 7 GHz. So you're in this really weird position where if you look at the FP32 performance, the vanilla GTX 1050 has about 1.86, 1.87, depending on boost clocks. The uh, GTX 1050 Ti Ti hits about 2.10, 2.14 T-flops, but the GTX 1050 3GB model has 2.33 T-flops. All thanks to, once again, 768 CUDA cores, but a higher uh, boost clock than the 1050 Ti. Don't get me wrong, I'm not particularly uh, a major fan of the 1050s 2 gigabytes of VRAM. It's just not enough in modern games. Even at 1080p, VRAM just gets gobbled up really fast. Even the frame buffer itself for the current rendered frame is huge nowadays. But while I appreciate the fact that they have increased the VRAM, it's just a really baffling decision to have a lower memory bandwidth for just 84 gigabytes per second but the core which is found in the card the gp107 has had its specifications bumped i'm going to be curious to see what happens with actual testing and i'm also going to be curious to see if any aibs decide to put out models of the card which have let's say eight gigabytes of gd i'm uh, sorry eight gigahertz gddr5 the reason, of course, NVIDIA have probably done this is to not cannibalize the GTX 1050 Ti, because otherwise the specifications of this card would pretty much render the Ti pointless, other than the fact that it's got 4GB of GDDR5 memory, so that, once again it does have a slight memory uh, advantage in terms of the sheer amount. So unless, once again, the memory is very overclockable, I would probably suggest that you stay away from this card, because in my opinion, despite the fact that Pascal has very good compression when it comes to uh, how it handles data and how it sends out around the card, I just can't imagine 84 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth being sufficient. Just for frame of reference, the 1050 vanilla, the two gigabyte model, has 112 gigabytes per second. So yeah, that's quite the golf. It's hard to believe that the PlayStation 4 has been out for so long now. Of course, the PS4 as well as the Xbox One were released back in 2013. Since then, we've had a half-generation refresh with the Xbox One X and the PlayStation 4 Pro, but let's face it, we're waiting on the next-generation systems. With the systems being out now for almost five years, we can, of course, 
expect rumors of the next generation consoles to become more frequent. And over the past couple of months, evidence for the usage of the Zen architecture in the next generation consoles has become increasingly prevalent. The website Foreignx.com has found a rather interesting piece to the puzzle, and that is it does almost feel certain at this point that the Zen architecture will indeed be in the PlayStation 5, and in my opinion at least, and I could certainly be wrong, and if I am wrong, I'm going to be very curious to see what the alternative is, but I at this point feel it's almost certain it's going to be in the PlayStation uh, success, um, sorry, the PlayStation competitor, the Xbox as well. So what am I actually talking about? Well, Simon Pilgrim, who is a principal programmer at Sony Computer Entertainment, you can actually find his linked, uh, LinkedIn profile, and that he has indeed been working on compiling tooling for various PlayStation devices. But on GitHub, G-I-T Hub of course, he has also been a very busy bunny. On Friday he released a cleanup for the ZNVR1 code, and this is not a one-time deal, he's been doing it multiple times with multiple different commits. Uh, this at least for two weeks. So this is not a one-off, this is actually a trend. So, just for some clarity here, it's important for us to remember that ZNVR1 is a reference, of course, to the Zen architecture, the original Zen architecture, for example, the 1700 processors, and so on. It's also important for us to know that LLVM is not new for the PlayStation ecosystem. In fact, Paul T. Robinson released a PDF back in the seventh, back in 2013. It was in seventh uh, of November, and they released a rather in-depth um, overview of the developer toolchain for the PS4, with a broad overview of exactly what the specifications of the system were. Of course, it was new back then, as well as the toolchain at a glance. Uh, telling you essentially what you needed to develop for the machine and what the pros and cons of the new compiler, uh, front end, and so on. So the CPU compiler was an LLVM with Clang front end, and of course this is primarily for C and C++. So for the toolchain to continue to evolve for the next PlayStation using the same compiler is not particularly surprising. What we have here, of course, is further evidence that yes, we are looking at Zen, but what exactly can we ascertain from this? What can we dissect? Well, at the moment, the news actually provides us a lot more questions than what it does answers. We once again can say yes, it's most likely using the Zen Plus architecture, or sorry, Zen architecture for the new PlayStation. Unfortunately, the fact that it's ZNVR1 doesn't necessarily mean that it's definitely using the first generation of Zen inside the PlayStation 5. It's possible that these optimizations may well carry on to ZNVR2, which if you prefer the idea of dealing with it in PC terms would be the Zen 3000 series. The other thing, of course, is it doesn't also tell us what process it would be created on. That is the actual APU itself. What we do know is that Ryzen 3000, aka Zen 2, will be manufactured on a new process. It will be built on 7nm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the PS5 will be. It's possible we could see the older Zen core on a newer process. It's possible that we could see the Zen 2 architecture on the newer process. And almost certainly, no matter what the actual CPU is, there's almost without question going to be a lot of tweaks and changes which go into the actual creation of the CPU, which help separate it from the vanilla versions of the chip and of course it has instead been customized for the consoles. As for the configuration, well that's even more confusing. Obviously one of the benefits of Zen over let's say the Jaguar CPUs which are found in both the current Xboxes as well as Playstations is that it runs at A higher clock speeds and B the IPC is considerably higher. So what we could have is four physical cores, and those four physical cores could have two threads, SMT, so that means eight threads. 
This would be very easy if they decided to do backwards compatibility. So for the sake of argument, you could take your PlayStation 4 game, put it inside the PlayStation 5, and it would simply be able to run without too much of an issue. They could also decide to go with eight physical cores and disable SMT, or finally, they could go with eight physical cores, but with SMT enabled, 16 threads total. I don't necessarily know if they'd go that route. They certainly could. But with eight physical cores, even on a 7nm process, it could certainly be very power hungry and possibly also producing a lot of heat. Don't forget that we're also going to be seeing the GPU inside the APU. And what of the GPU? Well, most likely it's not going to be Polaris based. Let's just be honest at this point. Therefore, Vega or possibly a Navi version is the most likely scenario here. And what do I mean by version? Well, just like Polaris had been customized for the Xbox One X, and we saw other GCN versions customized for the PlayStation 4 or the vanilla Xbox, we can almost certainly expect whatever GPU which is found inside these new generation of consoles to have some level of hardware customization. Ultimately, any numbers I gave you in terms of T-flops is also a little bit difficult to quantify as well because a T-flop is not necessarily a T-flop. Sure, if you have one architecture that's, say, putting out 1.4 T-flops and you have another architecture which is extremely similar that's putting out 1.4 T-flops, then you can do like-for-like -like comparisons. But when we're looking at a couple of generations difference or a completely ar different architecture to begin with, then T-flops don't necessarily translate to one another. Nevertheless, I do suspect that we're going to be seeing the new generation of PlayStation and Xbox completely and utterly dominate the Xbox One X. Because otherwise, let's face it, what would be the point in actually releasing it? With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, if you want more technical analysis and rundowns and that type of stuff, click the subscribe button and the notification button. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video and hopefully I will see you again soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.